for watching today's teaching from Community Life Church. Open up your heart and see what God might say to you today through his word. Oh, I want to start with just a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you today and we just ask that you would open our hearts to hear from your word and what you want to share with us today. We are here to listen, not just with our ears, but with our hearts as well. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have a question to start off with today. My question is this. What do you want? What do you want? And more specifically, what do you want this summer? You know, I see these slides with these like Hawaiian looking flowers. It makes me think about what do I want this summer? You might want some of these same things. I want to go to the pool a lot. I want to go to the beach. I want to go out to the lake. I want to read. I want to relax. Um, you can probably all, you know, maybe want to do some of those things. Something else that I really want to do this summer, maybe you can relate to, maybe not. I really want to clean out my attic. Okay, I love getting rid of junk. Does anyone else love getting rid of junk? I love getting rid of junk. Do you know that new um, lady, the show Marie, what's her name? Yes. We're like soul sisters. Like, she loves to get rid of junk. I love getting rid of junk. My problem is, though, sometimes my husband and I have a different definition of what's junk. Um, but I'm not going to share that too much um, right now. But what do you want this summer? Did you know that Jesus actually asked this question, a form of this question, what do you want, to several people that he encountered? There was a blind man. He said, what do you want? There was a mom of two of his disciples, and he literally said, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? And so before we dive into this series, I have a question. If Jesus stood before you and said, what do you want this summer, wh what would you say? Would you have an answer for him? Because, see, we are so much more motivated to do things that we actually want to do, right? We're motivated to do things when we want to do them. Isn't that, like, the million-dollar secret of parenting? Like, not just to get your kids to do something, but to get them to want to do what you want them to do, right? Any parents, can you, did you hear what I said? To get your kids to want to do what you want them to do. If you have figured that out, then I want to take you out for lunch and spend some time with you because um, that would be worth a million dollars to me. But we are starting this new series that we're going to camp in this summer called Summer in the Gospels. And I'm going to share a text a little bit later in the service today, but I want to take this first chunk of our time together and just kind of set this series up and really share what is on our heart. Why are we even talking about this this summer? And really to answer the question, what do you want this summer? Because I have prayed about this, we have prayed about this as the pastors and leaders of this church, of what do we want for this church this summer? And it's actually pretty simple. If you want to throw up the next slide, it's this. The purpose of this series, to know Jesus in a whole new way this summer. You know, that sounds really churchy, right? But to know Jesus in a whole new way this summer. There are lots of things in the Bible that are, are great for us, that we can learn values and ways to live. But at the end of the day, we want to know Jesus. You know, and right now is actually the best time of summer because it's like stretched out right in front of us, right? It's such a great time. But don't throw any tomatoes at me or something for this, for saying this. But did you know in just like 10 weeks from now, we're going to be in the middle of August and we're going to be looking back at summer and saying, where did it go? You know, we all know. We've all been there, right? Where did it go? And I want us at the end of the summer to say that we're different. I want us to say that we actually don't just know about Jesus, but we actually know Jesus. And that there's no better thing that we could actually do this summer than invest time in getting to know Jesus. So we're going to spend time this summer, summer in the Gospels, getting to know the first four books of the Bible. The Gospels are the first, the first four books, I'm sorry, of the New Testament, are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, say that with me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and and John. Okay, those are the Gospels. Those are the first four books of the New Testament that talk about the life of Jesus. And the thing about these books is they are actually eyewitness accounts to the life of Jesus. Eyewitness accounts. We can learn so much. And I couldn't pass up this opportunity. How many of you have been an eyewitness 
to a crime or something. Anybody? Okay. Some of you have heard my story from a couple weeks ago, but I actually was seriously considering changing professions um, a couple weeks ago from a pastor to like a police detective, okay? Because I was an eyewitness to something a couple weeks ago. We were in Christiansburg. Um, it was a Sunday night. My family was in town. We were at the Christiansburg Walmart, and we were going to buy Jazzy, who's our middle daughter, a new bike. You know, how many of you, if you're not, if you're like the middle child, you always get hand-me-downs, right? So Jazzy thought she actually needed a new bike. Camille had had several new bikes. She needed a new bike. So we were going to buy her a new bike at the Christiansburg Walmart. But, of course, she couldn't find a bike at Walmart. We needed to go to Target. So I'm in my minivan. My family's in the car. My parents are in town visiting. And right in front of me was this SUV as we're getting ready to pull out of Walmart. This red pickup truck comes blazing in and crashes into this SUV. All of a sudden, you know, my adrenaline was like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I just saw this. The red pickup backs up and then peels off. So then I have witnessed a hit and run, right? And thankfully, everybody was okay. I jump out, make sure everybody's okay in the SUV. But then I was like, I'm a witness, right? Guys, go with me. Like, <laughs> I don't have that many exciting things that happen in my life, okay? This was exciting, okay? I am an eyewitness. So I called 911. I've never called 911 before. I called 911 and said, I would like to report hit and run. So I do all this stuff, the officer comes, I fill out the form or whatever, sign my name to give my statement, and then, you know, there's nothing else I can do, so we go on, go to Target, Jazzy gets a bike, in case you're wondering. Jazzy got a bike, we're driving on our way home to come back to Radford, and I just happened to look over at this parking lot, and I saw the truck, guys, I saw the same truck! Like I said, nothing exciting ever happens to me, so I was like, that's the truck! We pull in the parking lot, verify, yes, that's the truck. The taillights busted out, yes. I called 911 again, and of course they're like, hey, Renee, what's up? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they, I was like, hey, I'm the one that reported the hit and run, and I found the truck. And they probably thought I'd been driving around looking for it, but I actually had not. Um, but I reported the truck, what I, you know, whatever. I was an eyewitness. Do you get it? I remember every detail. I can give you a lot more details if you want them. I was an eyewitness to this. See, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are eyewitness accounts to the life of Jesus. And just like I'm probably going to have to go to court and give this testimony about this, whatever, these guys are giving a testimony about the life of Jesus. And so this summer, we are going to purpose to know Jesus in a new way through reading these eyewitness testimonies. We're, like I said, I'm going to share a short story from one of these in just a minute, but I wanted to take a, a chunk of time together just to set this up today because I actually read a book a few years ago. It was called Move. It says what 1,000 churches reveal about spiritual growth. And they actually did a study over of 1,000 churches over ten, a 10-year 10 period to come up with something that you're going to say like, duh, that's obvious. But if you throw up the next slide, this is what they found. They found over the study that reflection on scripture is the most powerful spiritual practice. Reflection on scripture is the most powerful spiritual practice. If we want our lives to change, we, ha we have to read and reflect on God's word. And hear me, as one of your pastors, there's a lot of things that I really want you to do. I want you to come to church. I miss you, literally, when you're not here. I want you to come to church. You know, I want you to be in a small group. I want you to tie the first 10% of your income. I want you to serve, and I want you to volunteer in the church and outside of the church. But if you could do only one thing to invest in your life spiritually, it would be this. Read and reflect on God's word, on scripture. That will change our lives. That will take us from just being a believer to being a disciple. And so we're going to actually, um, Fritz is going to sing a song over us here in just a second. Um, so as he gets ready, I want to just share. That is why we gave everyone one of these as you came in today. If you throw up the next slide, Ethan. This is a summer reading guide. And yes, it's cute, and I love the way it turned out, but that's not the reason we're giving these out. This, this is to get us in God's word, in these eyewitness accounts this summer. There's track one if you want to read all four of the Gospels. 
There's track two if you want to just read through the Gospel of Mark and go deeper. But I want to beg you to do this this summer. You know, if you're a parent of a child that can read, find a way to make this fun for them and get them in the Word. If you are a youth, a college student, or a grown-up, I want to ask you to commit to yourself or with someone else to get into these Gospels this summer. Maybe, you know, read them and then get together with someone and talk about it once a week or set up a, a chat group with a couple of your friends or a group text and just share a couple sentences every day what you're gleaning from this. But before we actually go into the, the one story that I want to share today, I've asked Fritz just to sing a song over us. Now, if I was in Bible college taking a class about preaching, they would say, Renee, this is not a good time for a song because this is right the middle of your sermon. But the reason is because before we go into the Gospels, I want us to decide that knowing Jesus is what we want this summer. And this is a song called Knowing You. The first couple lines of the course just say, Knowing You, Jesus, Knowing You. There is no greater thing. There is no greater thing. And this song, if you want to throw those lyrics up, Ethan, this, um, this song, actually, if you go back, I'm sorry, go back to the slides from the sermon. It's right in there. Um, this song is, was important to me when I was in college, and this is about an older song, about 15 years old, which at the age I am, 15 years is actually not that long. It used to be a lot longer, but knowing you and this song is just the cry of our heart for this series so we're going to dig into a story in just a second but can we just listen as fritz just sings this over us and can we make this our cry for the series all i once held dear build my life upon all this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain I have counted lost, spent and worthless now compared to this. Knowing you Knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know. To be found in you and known as yours. To possess by faith what I could not earn. All surpassing gift of righteousness. Knowing you. Knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Would you sing it with me? Knowing you. Fritz a hand. Thank you. So that was my, goodness, I'm eating the mic here. That was my introduction. Okay, so now 
we're going to dive into the scripture for just a few minutes. And I want to just share a short story with you. Um, I'm taking the track two, which is dive deeper into the book of Mark route this summer. So as I started studying the book of Mark, Mark chapter one, a few weeks ago, I was just hooked. So I'm going to share a story with you from Mark chapter one, because I couldn't even get any farther without God just completely just speaking to my heart. So a little bit about Mark's gospel before I read you the story. Mark's gospel was written by, um, we don't even need a drum roll for this. It was written by a guy named Mark, okay? Fairly obvious. Actually, his name was John Mark. Mark was his middle name. I don't know if you guys know, but my husband, Rodrigo, that's actually his middle name. You can ask him his whole name later because you won't be able to pronounce it. Um, so Mark was written by a guy named John Mark. He was actually not one of the, the disciples. He was the BFF of Peter, who was one of the first disciples that Jesus called. And see, Peter saw it all. Peter saw the whole thing. He was that eyewitness. But Peter was also a fisherman. So he was probably illiterate. And at, by the end of his life, was like, I need to have this account written down so it's preserved for the generations. So he gets his buddy, Mark, to write this gospel. So that is likely how the gospel of Mark came to us, what, how the scholars believe we got it. Um, Mark's ultimate purpose in writing this book is right up here. It says, the ultimate purpose of Mark is to present Jesus' universal call to discipleship. Can you say that with me? Discipleship. Discipleship. See, that's a word in our American church that we kind of have gotten away from a little bit. We are great at being believers. We believe. You ask a lot of people, especially in our area, in the South, do you believe in God? They believe. But did you know even the devil believes in God? Even the devil believes in Jesus. We are not just called to be believers. We're actually called to be disciples. A disciple is someone who follows. A disciple is someone who says, Jesus, you're the master, I'm the servant. A disciple is one who gives their life away to make other disciples. And that is Mark's purpose in writing this book. And last thing about the Gospel of Mark is that it's a really fast-paced narrative. He, he loves action words. I think that's why I love this Gospel so much, why I'm drawn to it. You know, my husband says I have two words that describe me, intense and super intense. I guess that's three words. But the, I love this. He, Mark is just, just like this. He's in the fast lane. He doesn't have a slow lane. He uses words like immediately and suddenly and at once. You're going to see those if you read through this gospel. There's always action and always something happening. But that's going to be important in this story I'm going to read to you. Because in the midst of activity and action, Jesus actually is going to slow down. He's going to stop. And he's going to do something significant. And I have learned sometimes through painful situations that significant things don't usually happen in the fast lane. We usually have to slow down and stop for a minute and take that time. And that is what Jesus did. So Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Let's look at this. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion. Don't miss that. Moved with compassion. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said. Be healed. Immediately, instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. Go to the priest. Let him examine you. Take the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus. He couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay in secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. Maybe you've read this story many times. Like, I've actually read this story many, many times. But when I was reading it and studying it the other day, in an attempt to do what we just sang about, I, I sat down and said, Jesus, I just want to know you. I want to know you more. I want to know you in a new way. And I read Mark chapter 1, and some words jumped out at me. If you go to the next slide. Moved 
with compassion. And ever so gently, Jesus just spoke to me. It wasn't, I didn't hear it with my ears, but I heard it with my heart. And it was so gentle, but it was so clear. He said, Renee, when was the last time that you were moved with compassion? When was the last time that you were moved with compassion? And see, we have to unpack that a little bit because moved actually means exactly what it says. Like you have to move, you have to do something. You're not, you can't stay in the same place. You actually do something about it. And Jesus just whispered in my heart in that moment that when we are moved with compassion, we actually look more like Jesus. We look like Jesus when we are moved with compassion. And see, I was asking Jesus, I want to know you better. And he just began speaking to me about this. When is the last time that I've been moved with compassion? Because let's think about what was going on here. You know, there was a man with leprosy. Now, you may or may not know what the implications of that were in those days, but leprosy is the skin disease that is infectious. And obviously there are physical implications, but even more than the physical implications were the social implications. See, if you had leprosy, you had to live outside of the village. You were estranged, estranged from your family. You couldn't live with your family. Like, if you're a mama and you have babies and you have leprosy, you don't get to be with your babies. You're, you're cast out. You have no way to make a living you are considered unclean, which means you can't go to the temple and worship God. That was how they related to God. They could not go to the temple. They were unclean. And no one would touch you. No one. How many of you are touchy people? Raise your hand if you're a touchy people. Oh, I'm a touchy person. I am a touchy person, and I have likely given a hug to almost everyone in this room. And some of you would be happy if that was the last hug I ever gave you. But I'm trying to work on that. I'm, I, I'm a touchy person. I love giving hugs, like my middle daughter, Jazzy, she is touchy, we sit and watch a movie and she's just all over you and I love it. If you had leprosy, no one would touch you, not your spouse, not your kids, not your friends, no one could touch you. They, they were afraid they'd get the disease and they would be declared unclean. And so this man that came to Jesus was desperate and broken and Jesus was moved with compassion. See, Jesus didn't just stand back and say, be healed. Do you see what he said? He said he reached out and he touched him. He said, I'm willing, be healed. And my, many of us, you know, myself included, would like to think that we are compassionate and caring people. And many of us are. I know many of you, and you are. But some of you, like me, live life in the fast lane and there's always one more thing to do. And sometimes we don't have any room in our life for compassion. I know sometimes I don't. You know, extending care to someone without expecting anything in return. And we've become desensitized or maybe we've gotten compassion fatigue because there's always someone that needs something from me. Or there's always one more heartbreaking crisis in the world and we just become numb. But see, if anyone should have been desensitized or if anyone shouldn't have had time for compassion, it was Jesus. See, in, the, in Mark chapter 1, I told you, I couldn't even get through Mark chapter 1 without all of these things jumping out. If you want to throw up on the slide um, the one that lists what Jesus did in Mark chapter 1. Jesus gets baptized. He goes on a 40-day fast. He recruits his first disciples. He teaches in a synagogue, drives out an evil spirit. Then he heals Peter's mother-in-law, and then he heals everyone in the whole town. That all happened before the guy with leprosy got there. Jesus was a busy guy, right? And he had a lot going on, yet we saw that he was moved with compassion. He had been around broken people, yet he found a way to see the man that was right in front of him. And what was his secret? I got to know his secret. And I believe his secret was found just a couple verses before our story in Mark 1, 35. This is what it says. Before, this is right in the midst of all that activity that Jesus was doing. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up. He went out to an isolated place to pray. See, Jesus was getting his own soul filled up. 
Jesus had space to be moved with compassion because he took time to get his own soul filled up by God. And we have to create space and we have to take sufficient care of ourselves so that we have the space for compassion. You know, Friday I went to pick up my kids from school. It was the last day of school, and I was in the pickup line at McCarg Elementary, and I rolled the window down to talk to one of the, the guys in line there. And, you know, I was picking up Preston, my little Preston, who just finished preschool, and now he's going to my last baby. He's going into kindergarten. And I know, I don't, I have mixed feelings about that, but I was talking to one of the teachers in the pickup line. And I was like, oh boy, I bet you're glad to get rid of these kids for the summer, you know, being so nice. And he said in the sweetest voice, like I, it just caught my attention. He said, well, it's actually, it's kind of bittersweet. And I was like, really? Like, I'd be jumping for joy. Um, He said, it's actually kind of bittersweet. You know, I really enjoy the kids. And he said this, I also know that this school is the most stable place that some of these kids have. That is a heart of compassion. Not just seeing, okay, what's in it for me? He was seeing these kids through a different perspective. Lord, let us see how you see. That's what it means to have compassion, to be moved with compassion. And the last thing I wanna share, and I don't want us to miss this, you have to hear this. Compassion will always cost you something. Did you hear that? Compassion will always cost you something. When you get close to brokenness, you might get cut with the sharp edges of brokenness. Your heart will certainly break when you get close to brokenness. And it cost Jesus something. If you remember the end of the story, he told the guy, don't tell anyone. I don't blame the guy. The guy went and told everyone. I would have done the same thing. But it cost Jesus his freedom. If we look at the end, the next slide at the end of that, it says, that Jesus could no longer move around freely. He couldn't enter, publicly enter a town anywhere because of the crowds and the mob. It cost him something. And see, most of us have the luxury that we don't have to be compassionate. You know, many of us have all we need. And that is the curse of being comfortable. I'm, I'm telling you, that is the curse of being too comfortable. We wanna look like Jesus, we wanna know Jesus. He was moved with compassion. And so I just want to ask you the same question he asked me. As I said, I just want to know you. That's all I want. He said, Renee, when was the last time you were moved with compassion? And we're going to close in just a second. I just want to pray over us. Who is the person or the group of people in your life that needs you to reach out, that needs you to touch them, that needs you to enter their pain? that needs you to bring the healing that only Jesus can heal. That is, that is what Jesus looks like. That is how we know him in a whole new way. I'm gonna ask you just to stand with me. I just wanna pray over you as Matt comes to close us. Close your eyes with me. When was the last time that you were moved with compassion? Not just felt pity or felt sorry for someone, you were moved with compassion. You saw the brokenness of someone else. Lord, I just pray right now for a wake-up call. I know you gave me a wake-up call a couple weeks ago when this text just entered my life in a fresh way and just challenged me to slow down, to look around, to see. And Lord, I just want to pray right now over my brothers and sisters. I pray you would help us have eyes to see the way you see. Help us to enter the world of others, to bring the healing that only you bring. And Lord, if some of us are just so busy that we don't even have space for this, help us find the time to carve out and get our souls filled up so that we can pour out. And God, I pray for myself, for my babies, for this church, that this summer would be a summer that we know you. We know you more. We know you better. At the end of the summer, when we're looking back and saying, where did the summer go? We will be different. We have interacted with your gospel, with these eyewitness accounts of what you did thousands of years ago that still matter today. And so, God, I just pray 
that whatever challenge we need today, Lord, that we would walk out of here with that today. God, just a fresh, a fresh outpouring for, for us, your kids here, your children here at Community Life Church. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching today. For more information about our church, please visit our website at www.clife.church. We really look forward to meeting you. Bye!